Let's open this up with prayer. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. Gentlemen, thank you so much for attending today's webinar. Happy first Friday of June, a special month dedicated to the Sacred Heart. Obviously, we want to live virtuously as a means to reach God. If you miss the last webinar, that's what we talked about. We were talking about Virtue understood in the Christian way does not mean uh, just the perfection of myself for some sort of prestige, for personal enrichment, for my own satisfaction. Although it does bring ultimate happiness, virtue does not always bring comfort or pleasure. Hence, the life of Christ was perfectly virtuous yet ended on the cross. But we know that also through the resurrection, the truth of God that Christian virtue brings us to beatitude, to life in God, which is why we live it. We live virtuously in order to reach God, not as some sort of pagan virtue, as the excellence of the self, although that's good, and especially not some sort of secular self-help in a way to uh, bring our discomfort within us to manageable levels and our reasonable pleasure and so-called happiness to higher levels. We're not doing that either. We're trying to reach God. That's what we're doing. Today we're going to talk about another, so if we, we put that last week uh, in the context of pagan virtue in the ancient world. So how did Aristotle understand virtue, and then how did people like Augustine adopt that understanding of virtue, yet still baptize it so that we completely understand it in the light of Christ and the, and the Christian revelation? Um, that's what we did last week. Today we're going to look at how can we understand what's the greatest uh, foe we have for our virtue in the modern setting, in the modern setting. So what are we facing today? That's what the early Christians understood and thought about was sort of the pagan virtue. What's the biggest threat we as men are facing uh, in our modern era? So I put this in the context of individuality uh, because if there's one thing that really defines the modern era, right, it is the rise of the autonomous individual that we are free to live how we want to live. Don't tell me what to do. Don't tell me what to eat. Don't tell me how big my big gulp soda can be. Don't tell me anything because happiness is freedom and freedom is detachment from anything that would restrict me as an individual, individual from pursuing my own ends, which I have defined make me happy. So you might say I look like a man, but I have defined that I feel like a woman on the inside and it is my happiness to enact that no matter what you think, because it comes from within me. Uh, so that's kind of an extreme example, but we could say, you know, just don't tell me what to do. Now, of course, in certain contexts, yes, individuals do have a liberty that is proper to them as individuals, but it is the modern era that really understands radical liber liberty to be me alone with my own choice. Michael Sandel put it, for the liberal self, what matters above all, what is most essential to our personhood is not the ends we choose, but our capacity to choose them. So that word liberal there, I know in our modern context in America that that, you know, liberal conservative is how we understand both of our political parties. But really, on the right and the left in our country is liberalism, meaning in sort of the classical sense that I am at liberty to do what I want. On the left, we might have, I can do what I want with my body, with morality. On the right, I can do what I want with my money and my own wealth. All these things is don't tell me what to do with what is mine. That is liberty. And on the right and the left, we have the radical desire uh, to have choice. That's sort of our ultimate slogan. We know that's the ultimate slogan on the left when it comes to things like abortion and sort of the ultimate slogan on the right, that I can do whatever I want economically and morally. So where did this all come from? We, we, and we, sometimes we, especially us American men, we don't even know how differently we think from so many people throughout the ages that had an ST in front of their name, right? As in all the saints, Christ himself, the church fathers, certainly the monastics, uh, and, and just sort of solid theological understanding they did not see the self as the ideal that we're pursuing and the self's own freedom. 
That doesn't mean freedom's not important. That doesn't mean the self's not important. We'll get to that. But why do we as modern men think so differently? And a lot of people point back to Descartes. And I know if you're on this call, you're thinking, oh, here we go again, blaming it all on Descartes. Sorry, I'm going to pile on, okay? It makes it easy to understand because a lot of people have heard this phrase. If you don't recognize Descartes, He's the one sort of famous for inaugurating what we now might call, um, you know, the critical method of various things where we sort of begin with skepticism of what came before in order that we can pursue objectively something that's true. But what that really mean for, meant for Descartes was stripping away all tradition, all previous thought, anything that didn't come from himself and his own direct experience, but he even tried to deny his experience, right? That he was just beginning with pure thought. So he didn't know where to begin. I can't begin on inherited theology. I can't begin on tradition. I can't begin on custom. I can't begin on anything. So where do I begin? And he gives us that famous, uh, how is it? Uh, ergo cogito sum, cogito ergo sum, cogito ergo sum. I think, therefore I am. Right? So he begins within himself. And just so you know, a little background, Descartes' whole mentality really began when he was fighting for the German army and he found himself stationed alone in a shack thinking all winter, totally alone. He seemed to have a strange enjoyment of that. A lot of people might think it's torment. Descartes apparently liked it. It sort of makes sense when you get to his philosophy. He said, I spent the whole day shut up in a room heated by an enclosed stove where I had complete leisure to meditate on my own thoughts. Somebody who says that, you can imagine, they would come up with something like, I think, therefore I am. Everything begins objectively, stripping away all preconditioning, tradition, custom, all that stuff, authority. Got to strip it all away so that we can begin. And this really is the birth philosophically. I know there's others that contributed to it, to the idea that I can come up with not only my own morality, I can even define happiness itself, right? So I can have things, this, I mean, we, when we, even us Americans, the pursuit of happiness, what's the pursuit? We don't presume that we can find it. We just, we can pursue it. We don't really define that happiness. Now we can make that work very easily as Christians without even mental gymnastics, but we very much have to make sure that our happiness is God and nothing else. It's God, nothing else. That is our happiness. And we don't have to pursue him because he pursued us. So yes, we have to pursue him in a, in a response to his love, but he's come to get us in Christ. That's, that's the whole point. Because the very order of creation itself is different from what Descartes and all sort of modern philosophy thinks. So here's an image of Michelangelo's famous paintings on the Sistine Chapel of creation. So think about it. The only person who was totally within themselves totally satisfied, totally happy, not contingent on anyone else. We have a name for that being, his, his name is God, right? Only God is perfectly happy within himself. He is both the definition of happiness and happiness within himself. Only he just exists, you know, totally, in a sense, isolated without unhappiness. When creation, when the material world is created, his act, his, he is pure act. He creates this world where around us, we have all this potential for good action, whereas God is pure and total act, right? He's unchanging. He doesn't become merciful because we beg him a lot. He already is merciful. And by us opening ourselves to the reality of his mercy, we can receive his mercy to operate within the world and the order and the nature and the grace that he gives us and we receive it right? That's how we respond. And that's how we reach happiness. And the very fact that we live in the material world means that we live around and in with other people. So Descartes, to come up with what he was coming up with, had to be alone. And really, he starts all of creation, all logic, all wisdom, all philosophy, all morality within himself. It's not hard to see today how easily it is for people to, to, to inherit this constant criticism of everything around them and to come up with their own morality, their own path to happiness. And, our, and our, what we have to do is just affirm whatever they're doing. Joseph Pieper has this beautiful reflection in his book, Abuse of Language, Abuse of Power, where he says, what's funny about all this is that it can become kind of a show because even the desire to communicate 
the very thought of uh, thinking of a word. So even when Descartes starts to put his thoughts in words, what was he intending to do with those words? He was intending to communicate them. He immediately becomes dependent on other people. The very reason we speak, the very reason we act, everything we do, by the very fact that we're in this material world is instantly connected to everyone around us, everything around, every creature, every person. And if we're honest with ourselves, within our humanity, we have those that came before us. We have tradition, custom, all that stuff. We are inheritors. We are heirs to so much. And we're going to give that away. We're simply not autonomous beings. That's not what we are. So to live in this state where you're constantly trying to assert yourself, discover who you are, or, or you know, find your hope and your health and everything in sort of being who you define yourself to be is agonizing. It's a, it's a grotesque freedom because the reality is we are connected. We wouldn't even want to communicate who we are unless there's someone else, in which case we're in immediately dependent on their affirming us. So all of us can't actually project onto the world who we are. We have to receive it. We have to have a certain openness to reality itself, which is why Joseph Pieper says, in the very attempt to know reality, there's already present the aim of communicating, right? So in other words, communion is the definition of truth, right? We are in communion with the world around us. And this is very, when we talk about the life of virtue, the reason that the, our individuality be, can become dangerous is that we actually become lonely in our efforts to just try hard to live virtuously because virtue can easily, we, you know, we, virtue is self-mastery, right? Self-mastery, which sounds a lot like self-fulfillment, but it's not. Self-mastery, we master ourself so that we can give it away to the other. Uh, Joseph Pieper defines some of the virtues like temperance is selfless, self-giving, right? So in the very moment we master ourselves, especially us as Christian men, what, why, why are we mastering ourselves if it's not to give ourselves away with love? Just like you can't, if you have a Christmas present, you can't give it away until it's in your possession, right? So we can't give ourselves away if we're mired in vice, in sin, we're not actually free. So when we do what our passions, sometimes our desires dictate to us, we become less free to give ourselves away. Just get, I, we don't need to go through examples. Just consider in your own life how it becomes harder to love your wife, your children, those around you, your friends, when you're wrapped up in your own pleasures and what you want, right? Because you're not actually, when you try to assert yourself, you're no longer the master of yourself. You can no longer give yourself away. You are no longer virtuous. This is an image here. Uh, of, of an illuminated script, medieval script here, trying to show the four cardinal virtues. The four cardinal virtues are really just one virtue. I mean, it's really just acting rightly. This first one we have here appears to be a scholar. That's the image of prudence. So in virtue, first, the first cardinal virtue is prudence. We have to think correctly, perceive reality correctly. But as Joseph Pieper said, the very reason we want to perceive it correctly is to communicate. So prudence directs our actions. And the moment that action is born out of our mind into act, it's measured by the virtue of justice. That's the next one there. We have an image of a king in blue holding a sword because, hey, it's the medieval times. If you're a king, you need a sword, right? So it's, it's the moment it comes into action, it's immediately judged. Does it cause harm or does it do good to those around us? Does it give to others their due? We literally... Because we live in a material world, we do act. We always act. There's always some action we're engaged in, or potentially so. And the moment it enters the world, it's immediately measured by justice. Is it the right thing? Right in Latin is translated juice, which is where we get justice, right? Right action is justice. The next one we have in the armor there is fortitude, though, because as soon as that act is born, there might be other people that aren't prudent, that aren't just that are causing harm to our chosen course of action. So they come and they attack us, but fortitude ensures that we do not give way to fear, right? So even the martyrs, we don't give up. Total heroic sacrifice if we have to, we're not giving up what is right. And then the last one there is the image of the monk is the image of temperance. Because not only do we face attacks that come outside of us, but we face attacks that come within us, those passions, those desires, those things that wanna thwart us. 
I'm going to be a good husband. Wait, look over there. Maybe she's interested. No, I'm going to be a good husband, right? We have to discipline the self because we cannot allow self to wander. If self wanders in the pursuit of pleasuring or seeking some sort of good for itself alone, it's no longer virtuous and it has the potential, not just in the temptation, but in the act, it has the potential to wipe out all those guys before him. So you see the knight, the monk, and the scholar, I'm sorry, the knight, the king, and the scholar, they look super important, and they are. But just think, if we don't have temperance, the man has done all these things. He's thought of the right thing to do. He's enacted it rightly. He's defended it against those that would attack him. And then for some soft caresses or some taste in his mouth, he literally gives up the kingdom. We have only to think about Adam eating an apple and losing paradise. That's why justice, which a lot of people, we can, we can define virtue itself as justice, right action, consists in living one with another, meaning all virtue has this immediate relationship with those that are around us. So what, when we talk about living virtuously and we try to try hard and we're alone in our room with ourselves and our own thoughts, it's very easy to become more like Descartes in that freezing shack with a heater as he said, thinking about his own thoughts. He wasn't thinking about truth, right? He literally says, I'm thinking about my own thoughts. Do you know who thinks their own thoughts and thinks about their own thoughts? God, right? So it's very strange. Descartes, what he does and what modern liberal thought does is says, I think, therefore I am. Remember, it was God who, def- who Moses said, what's your name? And he said, I am, right? So Descartes says, I think, therefore I am, I decide. I am reality. I am truth. It comes from me. The Christian, we we have to flip that on its head because it's basically the same lie that we received in the garden, right? So this is this beautiful painting. Uh, If you want to look it up, it's um, Andrei Miranov, a Russian painter. But this is the fall of man. Uh, This is the fall of man. And that's Adam, that's Eve, just as they're cast out of the garden. What I love about this painting is it's him. He's got the what the hell just happened look on his face upside down in the painting. He's got nothing, but look, he's surrounded by nothing. You know, so many paintings of Adam and Eve, even being expelled from the garden, you can kind of see the garden, you see the new world right now. There's like this nothingness. And this is what we have when we strip ourselves from the love of God and from living in the truth of reality, which is God with the reality we receive from God. And we try to say stupid things like, I think therefore I am. And we try to live this self actualizing world. This image, this is what we're left with. Nothing right? This, we're left with nothing. This is why Father uh, Felix Serrata e Silvani and Liberalism as a Sin wrote, liberalism is the primordial sin, where we want to free ourselves to be able to do whatever we want disconnected. And what we actually do is disconnect ourselves from one another, from God, from nature, and from ourselves. And we got this picture of Adam here upside down. Like I said, what in hell just happened? I'm using the, the word hell theologically. Don't, don't judge me. Don't write me a note. All right. The life of a Christian is obviously very different. We're not seeking autonomy. We're actually living for a body, right? You remember St. Paul says, in Christ, we, though many, form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. Uh, Cardinal Seurat says this over and over. You Westerners, right? He's not quite a Westerner. He's steeped in our own tradition, but he knows our curses. You Westerners think that by being totally independent, you're happy, but you refuse to be heirs, right? You refuse to be, live in a network of dependency, he said. So now we live and we lack virtue and we're lonely. I mean, that picture of Adam is haunting, right? Let me go back here, right? Because his loneliness, even though his wife, Eve is right there within grasp, he can't quite reach her because sin isolates us in our loneliness. Virtue and life in Christ draws us together because we belong to one another. So our loneliness, our isolation, and our liberal thinking all keeps us from being virtuous. Here's a quote from Father Kalf in the last uh, two issues ago of Sword and Spade, uh, the one on belonging and communion. He's talking about his formation of young men in the seminary uh, at at St. Joseph's College Seminary in the Diocese of Charlotte. He says, the autonomous self, by definition, cannot be a part of something. We are lonely because we are not virtuous. Do you hear that? Men, loneliness is reported to be one of the greatest problems men face today. 
one of the greatest reasons for our suicide, our isolation from one another. He says, we are lonely because we are not virtuous. And we are not virtuous because we do not want to submit to the discipline of being formed. We don't want anyone else to tell us what to do. Right? So he's on the opposite. He's forming these men. Kneel here. Pray thus. You belong to him. Listen here. Learn this. Ultimately, we do not want to submit to being part of a whole. Without a whole, you can have no common good. A good we share and hold together, which has its own end and meaning. Indeed, a common good by definition is something that can only be possessed by sharing. We have so many false images of that word sharing. In fact, what's funny is we use the word to talk about what we do on social media, sharing. But you guys remember from kindergarten, the very definition of sharing something is when you have less of it. And when we share ourselves, we have less of ourselves. We have given it away. When we share a cake, we have less cake than we did before. When we share online, we're not sharing anything. We're showing things. We're trying to orient the, all the selves out there towards us. Look at me. Look at what I have. Look at what I've done. Look at how I look. Look at what I'm thinking, thinking here with myself. Right? That, that, that's not sharing. That's showing. To truly share, to, li- to, to love, requires another person and it requires the severing of ourself. So if you think about even the Ten Commandments, a lot of times we think of it as like, this is what I will and will not do. But even the Ten Commandments, they all of them presume our relationship to that which is outside of us. I am the Lord God, thy God. You shall not have any gods before me. Okay, so that's my relation to God. You should not use my name in vain. More my relationship to God. You remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. My relationship to God. And coincidentally, my relationship to nature and other people as well. That's another webinar. Next, you shall honor your father and your mother. Okay, my relationship to your parents. All right, so we've gone outside God and myself. Now we're in my household. Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not bear false witness, right? All these things presume our relationship with other people. So what God is not, he's not regulating just you alone. He's he's regulating you all, us, right? Our relationship to one another. There's this really interesting um, tidbit from uh, uh, um, Rene Girard from his book, uh, I Saw Satan Falling Like Lightning, which I have here. It has a terribly ugly cover, but it's a really good book. Um, And and he says, you know, it's interesting. Some of us think that the last commandment is kind of silly. Like, all right, we got the important ones out. God's name in vain, don't kill people. Okay, oh, by the way, don't covet what your neighbor has. That's kind of bad, right? Um, It might seem kind of silly, but actually he says the 10th and final commandment forbids a desire. It actually, that last commandment, opens us up to all sorts of reflections on where do we get sometimes our passionate pursuit of things that are sinful. Think about jealousy, envy. These things come from desire where we see what someone else has and we want it. The things you pursue, the things, the false identities you pursue is you've actually seen someone else have an identity. You say, I want that, right? It's this, this, it's actually this giant commandment that really regulates how we relate to the entire world by saying, don't look at the world as something for you to take and make your own. And the reason that's actually related immediately to the first commandment. Why? Because you will have no other gods. And your desire for other things is literally the reason you're going to create false gods. Whether it's your desire for safety, prestige, health, popularity, stuff, wives, oxen, servants, as the, test, as the, as the Old Testament puts it. Whatever it is, that's going to be the beginning of one, Cain killing Abel, but also you building false gods. So that last commandment, it's not the fizzling out like God couldn't think of anything else. Oh, yeah, 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 don't, don't fight over stuff. It's actually from the, at the very beginning of our life. We look up, and this, I see this all the time with my kids. There's this junky toy in the toy box. I mean, it's, it's like a car with one tire, right? It literally can't go. When they try to go, it scratches across the table, right? Which makes me upset. We won't talk about the table. We're talking about the car. And the baby looks up and goes, oh my gosh, look at that freaking car. That car is awesome. And the kid goes, and this is what uh, Gerard is talking, Rene Gerard in his book is talking about what causes conflict amongst men is actually the, and then the kid's like, I didn't even know this car was so great, but now that you're looking at it, yeah, this is a great car and you're not getting it. He goes, no, I really want that car. No, you're not getting this car. 
right? And that's, this is the spiral of conflict. We can laugh because it's kid fighting over the car, but is it no different than all the strife we have? I want the control you have. I want the authority you have. I want the stuff you have. I want the notoriety you have. I want that. And we start to get it. And the things we start pursuing, we're pursuing them because we desire them wrongly. That 10, that 10 commandment is actually super powerful. I love Carl Sandburg. He's, he actually has a house right up the street from me, or he did, sorry, he's long dead, goat farm up the road in Hendersonville. But he has this great saying in one of his poems, the secret of happiness is to admire without desiring. So this is part of living human is one, to be totally content, I'm sorry, not just living human, living holy and human, is that we live contented with God. Remember the last webinar, we're living virtuously so that we can reach God. And luckily, blessed for us, God gives himself to us so we can possess him, right? So we don't, we literally don't need anything else. What could be greater, for example, than receiving Jesus in communion? I mean, what else on this earth are we going to want? We literally have heaven within us. So the secret to happiness is being contented in our life with God, to not desire what other people have, and then to enjoy and see what other people have without, um, the strife, as Renee puts it, that goes with that. So how can we live uh, in, a, in ways that helps us to live virtuously and fight this individualism? One, it's detachment. And that's what I was just saying is that St. Louis de Montfort, his slogan, he's got all sorts of books, but his greatest slogan was God alone. Let us find our contentment, our happiness in God alone. So detachment is one of those words that we, you know, a lot of people use, oh, I don't like want things or I don't really care about things or I'm aloof about things. No, it just means that, and it doesn't mean actually that we hate things of this world, right? Quite the opposite, actually. What it means is that we have our total attachment in God. So the things that happen in this world literally cannot shake us. We know that we cannot be plucked from his hand. So we literally, the love of God does cast out all fear, right? Because our fear, all of our fears, all of our anxieties, all of our strifes, every single one of them comes from, oh my gosh, something I love will be taken away from me. Now, some of those are natural and they're good and God expects them of us, like the love of family. I fear robbers coming into my home. But even then, if myself and all my family, if we are prepared even for death because we're in the hands of God, ultimately, what do we fear? On a natural level as a father, I'm going to protect them. I'm not going to say, don't worry, kids, God's got you. Right? That, that's, no, I live in the material world. I'm supposed to act virtuously. I'm supposed to do what's right. In the natural order, that's what I do. But because all actions have been baptized in the fact of the resurrection, we truly do live without fear when we live in total and absolute love of God. This is a level of holiness I don't have, but I see it in the saints and I want it. No, I know. That's not a, not a bad desire. That's not coveting. I want to love God totally. Next is we have to be at a constant war with ourself. The world is telling us, do what makes you happy. My, one of my friends, I, he, he's got the best story of his parents who came to him when he was 15 years old. And his parents sat him down and he said, and he said I think we're going to get a divorce. And he's like, no. And they look at him and, and, and they said, son, don't you want us to be happy? And he said, no. No, I don't want you to be happy. I want to have a family. Right. So they had to be at war with their own desires in order to maintain the wholeness of their family. And they did. And they did. Actually, they were married until the death of the father. Right. So we have to be at war with ourselves, not pursuing our own ends, our own happiness, even our own definition of happiness. Nothing. But we have to presume. And this is not there's a lot to be said about Christian humility. This does not mean I, I hold my head down and I'm, I woe is me. No, no, no. It's presuming that if that the self is constantly trying to assert its own power over, over things, over the world around you, even over yourself. And that if you don't submit and have mastery over the self, then you cannot love. Again, that present. You can't give something away until it's in your possession. You cannot love or even act justly and rightly unless you possess yourself. If you're possessed by fear or desires, all those things, you can't give yourself away. You cannot be virtuous. And we can't belong to others. We must then bear this in mind all our life long, every day, every hour, every moment, that we may never indulge so much as a thought of self-confidence. That's Lorenzo Scupoli, The Spiritual Combat, one of the great spiritual classics. I remember picking up that book and thinking, man, this is going to teach me like spiritual karate and jujitsu. It's going to be awesome. But actually, it just showed me how much myself is constantly trying to assert it, itself. 
right? And that thing, self-confidence, that's like what we're trying to give. That's like the point of education today is self-confidence. Now there is certain calling for confidence, but confidence comes from the Latin words, con fides, with faith, right? It's not because you're amazing. It's because God is. And if you act rightly within his created order, that's called living virtuously, right? It's not self-confidence that I can do. I can be whatever I want to be. No, you can't. You cannot be whatever you want to be. Okay. I'm, I'm telling my kids that all the time. Last, you, I know you can't believe it. This is a, a webinar sponsored by Fraternus and Sword and Spade. You, I, I know you can't believe I'm ending with fraternity, but seriously, if we belong one to another, this is what scripture says, then we literally cannot be Christians unless we are connected to our community. And the definition of our community, according to scripture, is fraternity. Love the brotherhood. It's not as if the church is like a brotherhood. The church is a brotherhood. God sent his son to reveal that we are sons to the same father and that we are to live as brothers. That's who we are. This isn't a theme we have to drum up within us. This isn't some sort of um, cloaking or some sort of vocabulary that makes us feel better. The reality is we are brothers. When we live isolated, we don't have the things that virtue, i.e. belonging, as Father Cal said, brings, like accountability, encouragement. Those sort of things don't come when we're alone in our sin. And when we're alone in our sin, those things, the, our vices tend to multiply and hurt us constantly. And we, we might do it in a sort of modern way and not realize it, that what we're pursuing is just the self, our own, vir our own image of virtue within ourselves. But I am who I am. I'm not responsible for, to anybody. But we are. We belong to one another. And we are called, commanded to love one another. Christ says quite clearly, this is how they know you are Christians. This is how you are who you are when you love one another, right? And St. John the Apostle says, those who say they love God and don't love their brother are liars. They're liars. We have to live this community. I know that's difficult. I don't have easy answers for us because we live in the same Western society that's steeped in the liberalism that says I belong to nobody. But we as Christians have to wake up, I think right now, especially live the traditions, the customs, the culture, the identity of who we are, which is if we're baptized in Christ, we're baptized into the body of Christ. Gentlemen, we're coming to the end of this webinar. I want to remind you again, uh, this was sponsored by Sword and Spade Magazine, which is actually an apostolate that began out of Fraternus. Uh, as you know, it's primarily this here magazine. I hope if you're on this webinar, you're a subscriber. One of the things we're trying to do is put physical things into the hands of men so that they have worthwhile stuff to discuss. The distractions of modern media and the screens is simply too much to live fraternally and virtuously. We got to get off the screens, but we don't want to get off the screens and be like Descartes alone in our, in our huts uh, as winter rages around us. We need to get out in the sunshine in brotherhood and fraternity and discuss and God willing, even argue over these good things. As you know, subscribers are also able to access all the materials. Uh, the brother subscribers also get books sent to them uh, three times a year, and they have access to all the materials on the website, which are only available to be printed as or to be downloaded as PDFs because we're not going to start a blog that has a bunch of advertising and distracting links all over it because we're trying to live in reality with our brothers. So again, my name is Jason Craig. Uh, I'm going to hang around now for a while and answer any questions. But if you were attending this webinar on a tight schedule, thank you so much for attending. Uh, and I appreciate you very much. God bless. Why don't we end in prayer? In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen.